Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. It's so great to see some friendly faces here today. So the Harry Kirk Wolf Lecture is a special lecture for APA. So they invited me to give this talk at APA last summer, and then I got the chance to bring it to another regional conference, and I was so excited to come to this one because I've always wanted to come to SEPA, and I've never had the chance. So it's been a lovely, warm welcome. So thank you very much. But does anybody know who Harry Kirk Wolf is? Have you ever heard of him? Okay, Jane does, but she's a ringer. So here is Harry Kirk Wolf. Now, some of our founding fathers of psychology, you know, their legacy has not aged well, but I'm pleased to tell you that his has. <laughs> uh, he taught 21 and a half years. His students went on to be successful as attorneys, business owners, school teachers, administrators. 22 of his students went on to become successful in psychology. Three of his students later served as presidents of APA. So he's got a very distinguished teaching legacy. But I read his obituary and I was very moved. And I want to take a moment and read it for you. So this was an excerpt from his obituary, which appeared in Science. Such in brief is the outward career of a man whom all knew him to, whom, whom all who knew him knew to be possessed of a genius for teaching. There are few qualities which the teacher should possess which he did not own in exalted measure: keenness and kindness, unfailing humor, patience and generosity of soul, and the power to inspire. All these were his, and he was loved by those under his influence, as few men are loved. Now, I get a little chill when I read that, and especially to think that we're talking about love in science. And I wonder, when did we stop thinking about love in teaching? When did we stop thinking about teachers as this, this discipline as being loving and kind? I think we should definitely remember that and keep that in mind um, as we will continue in this talk a little bit later. So, what do we know about training for teaching? Let me get a sense of who is in the room today. So, let's see. How many uh, faculty in the room today? A lot of faculty. Any grad students in the room today? Um, okay. Um, all right. So, let me ask you, what, what, have, what kind of training did you have before you started teaching? Not a lot. This is it. One class. One, you had a class? Who had a class? One class teaching just psychology. One class teaching just... And it was one of my worst teachers. Okay, so not a great experience in the one class. All right, did we have like a... What did you have there? Fantastic examples of faculty who were faculty. What's that? Examples who were faculty. Examples who were faculty, so other people you could watch them teach, right? Well, we asked... Oh, Sabrina. Um, you taught me. I did. Entire summer class. <laughs> I did. I did teach you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so yes, I did. This is what I did for many years at Ohio State. Uh, for for 16 years, I taught a, a teaching class in a mentor teaching program. But it really always saddened me when I would go places and talk about it. How few people had an opportunity to have that kind of training. So we, when we were, I was involved in the IPI with many people in this room. And as part of the IPI, we wanted to know how intro psych teachers specifically. That's our biggest class. That's our biggest representation. Right. So, how are the people who are our best ambassadors to the you know to the general public? How are they trained? And so, this is what we found out. Um, you'll see the numbers are very small. <laughs> so, uh, you know, about thirty percent of people had some training before they taught for the first time, which means about seventy percent did not. Uh, you know, there was 33% had a credit-bearing class, um, an apprenticeship, teaching observation, and, but then we asked, okay, so what did you have before you taught, and then what did you have recently, like within the last five years? And there is a lot of ongoing development, so people are more likely to be doing workshops on teaching, or to be going to teaching conferences, or conferences with a teaching component, like SEPA has, and, and other courses do, or to do some online modules, so slightly more, not more than half, <laughs> but slightly more. So training, there's a dearth of people really investing in training, and I don't even think we have a really good definition for what training is. Um, so the census covered a lot of ground, but the, the, the training is a, is a piece, a gap that I think we really want to address. So, you know, the title of my talk, Sinking or Swimming, uh, you know, that's the sort of old metaphor that we all used to use. Uh, you know, you sink or swim, you get thrown in and you teach, and maybe you survive, and maybe you, ha you pick a different job. Uh, but I wanted to get some inspiration from from swim lessons. So how do we teach people to, so how do we teach people to swim? So I looked online, and this is a sort of rundown of some basic steps that are largely accepted by many swim instructors. 
So first, you have to consider your own qualifications. <laughs> so they always say, are you ready to teach someone to swim? Do you feel that you actually have the right you know, skill set to do this? Don't use, there's some past practices you should not use, like the Viking swim lesson where you just throw somebody in to the deep end, right, and let them flounder until they don't drown, apparently. Um, so they say, oh, no, no, you don't want to do that. Um, in curvers, you start slow, in, encourage them to get comfortable around the water, just get familiar with their surrounding, take a playful approach, right? Lots of positive reinforcement. Use buoyancy aids sparingly, right, so people can build the muscles and build the strength. Build conf confidence, not recklessness. Gradually build skills. Introduce people gradually, safely, into exploring new kinds of territory. Practice outside of the water, right? So practice in a safe space, not necessarily in, in, the, in the pool, right? Get some extra some practice, like micro teaching or something like that outside of the, the pool. Then have the learner lift their feet in the middle of the shallow end. And then swim short distances. The teacher with the learner swim a little bit together, right? Model the different strokes. Try them to encourage them to try different strokes. Don't bring them to the deep end unsupported. Let them get there at their own pace. And if we're doing this to teach people to swim, don't you think we could do a little bit more of this when we're trying to teach people how to teach students, you know, in our discipline, in college? Um, so I think we could take a few lessons there. So what I want to talk to you today about are just some of the current approaches. Let's, let's talk a little bit about your training and your experience, uh, what works, what's missing, how we can do better, uh, and then really how to shift this paradigm. What is it going to take? I mean, it's just not okay to say, well, this is just how it is. It's not okay to keep doing that, right? We know better. So what is it gonna take for us to change this? So there are a couple different approaches to teaching that you may recognize. So the first I like to call the shoreline sponge approach, right? So sometimes this is called an apprenticeship model. So how many of you were like a TA for a recitation, right? Were you like a teaching assistant or you had some kind of passive role in the class and you were there to observe? Oh, and just so you know, all these slides are available to you at the end, so don't worry if there's something you wanna capture, give you a code at the end so you can have access to all of them. But uh, so, the, so, you know, if you're a TA, maybe you lead a recitation, right? Um, you know, this, now there's some benefits to this because you're sort of hearing from somebody who's experienced. It's filling in maybe some gaps, some, some content gaps for you. It's real-time learning in the field, assuming there's supervision. And you can soak up the pedagogy, right? Ostensibly, but you know. It's not always that great, because the risks are it's very inconsistent. You might have a mentor who was great, who really helped you and gave you lots of opportunities to stretch and grow, or maybe you had somebody who maybe modeled poor teaching behaviors, or who wasn't a good model, or you know who didn't really help you at all and let you make mistakes. Does anybody have an experience, like the, did anybody experience the shoreline sponge model? What was that like for you? Yeah, good experience? Maybe a little bit of both. Okay, I'm getting some eh. All right, the wave pool approach. This is a little bit different approach. This one is sort of like there's an orientation, right? Now imagine you're in a wave pool. You've been to a wave pool yourself or with your family, and it's like calm, and then all of a sudden the waves, and then there's one like crashing wave, and then it calms down. Right? So this is that orientation model. So in an orientation model, you get maybe like one intense day or one intense week where they cram everything in there you need to know. Everything from how you write a lesson plan, how you write a test, what to do with academic misconduct, right? And then all the university policies and, and everything else, right? In one week, like in just a few days. Um, these can be very multidisciplinary. These can be taught and done by a teaching center or by a university. Um, so they can be campus-wide. And a lot of times they focus on the nuts and bolts, right? The rules of the university. Largely so no one gets sued, right? Um, now the risks are that they're sometimes very disconnected from a teacher's experience. Like they can be conducted in your department, but they can be just more general. Um, they're not always aligned with the specific things that you need as an instructor, and they really vary a lot in terms of quality. And sometimes they don't have any pedagogy at all. They're really just about the how-to. Anybody have an orientation before you taught? I see some hands going up also, an orientation, right? Like a day, a week? A week. Um, I've heard that like an hour, two days, right? I had an hour before my first teaching, right? So, so that's a very common approach. We see it a lot. Uh, one step up from that, I like to call the kickboard approach, right? So a little more support as you're going in. Um, now this is giving you a teaching class or a seminar 
it's nice if it can happen before teaching occurs. Sometimes it happens. Bill Buskis used to do it concurrently with, with his, TJ, uh, his teaching assistant. So either model can work. Um, it can be skills-based and or theory-based, which is nice. So you get a little bit of both, and you have a little more time to spread out that knowledge and give people time. In the course that I taught, we actually uh, we would work on some theory and some, and then actually put that into practice and build materials for the class in advance so they could get some field testing before they took things out for the first time. Uh, it can come from your home department, or maybe if you have uh, an education department, education teaching of teaching an uh, education department, they can offer this on some campuses as well. They can be very good. Um, and so these are. This is another great way. It can graduate students get credit for this on their transcripts. Right? They get credit for this. It's usually uh, you know a little more. Um, congenial, it's a little longer term, gives you more time to think, but there are risks, right? Because where does it fit in the broader, in the broader curriculum? Is it something that the department is actually going to support along with research training, right? If you look at the hours of clinical training and research training that a student accrues at the end of their doctoral program, and then you look at the number of hours that they accrued in terms of teaching training, it's shocking. It's so disparate, right? So that's going to be the thing that is always uh, usually diminished in favor of reaching in clinical. And that, those are valid things to do, right? But if they have to make a choice, teaching is not going to be valued at the same level. Um, and so sometimes when you're doing this in advance, it, it's hard for you to anticipate the questions that you're going to encounter when you actually have live students, no matter how, I mean, you know, we can only tell you to expect so much, you have to experience it yourself. And the first time you get an exam back and you're like, wow, but I, I told them, you know, I told them everything and they still don't get it, right? You're like, wow. You just have, you know, you have to have that experience. We can't tell you um, that that's going to happen. You have to experience some things for yourself. And I've also seen that some students who are preparing right before teaching are so nervous and anxious. They have so much cognitive load. Did you did you feel this? Did you feel this sense of like fright or nervousness or almost panic the first time you taught? Right? Just like, what am I going to do today? How am I going to do this today? That, that interferes with a lot of other ways uh, to think about teaching. So um, if we keep putting people in these very tenuous, not well prepared situations, the, the cognitive load is always going to interfere with their ability to really think and plan and be more nimble, as we heard Steve talk about yesterday, the ability to be nimble in, in the minute of the, con in the consultation. And then, of course, there's always off the deep end, right? Off the deep end, here's a class, here's a syllabus, good luck to you, right? Anybody experience this? A lot of hands just went up in the room, right? You just, well, you know, we know you know all this content. We didn't even get a syllabus. We're like, oh, you didn't even get a syllabus. Our own syllabus. Oh, even better. Here, make a syllabus. Here's a class. You be there at 10 a.m. Good luck to you. Right? That happens a lot, right? This, ha this happens a lot. Um, you're, if you're lucky, you have a friend who can share a syllabus with you. Uh, you may have some oversight. It may be supported. Um, in, the, in an ideal world, it would be. GTAs can very experiment, right? You can try out the things. If you know a few pedagogical things, you can try them out. You can try out group exams, or you could try out some active learning things um, if, you, if you know about them. Most of the time, you don't. So what are you doing? You're lecturing. You're getting up and doing what you've seen other people do, right? And so Often it just is, you know, you're just perpetuating the same practices. You're not really growing. Um, it's the most comprehensive experience. It's the most externally valid experience, right? So that's what you'll be doing in the future if you take a faculty position. But, you know, when you're copying someone else's syllabi, you're also copying the mistakes that they've made, right? And the things that didn't work uh, for them, you're just going to keep doing the things that didn't work too. It's too much responsibility usually for a novice in an already overwhelming context of graduate school. You now, graduate school is such an overwhelming time when students are, they have to be brave all the time. You're taking so many risks all the time uh, and then you have to do this other thing too where now students are depending on you as well. So it's very overwhelming. Lots of cognitive load and mistakes are really costly. Mistakes are really costly. We'll talk about that again. And then this, the no training approach. Nothing. You don't get anything. You, you get your degree, you go get a faculty job, and now you have to figure it all out your first day on the job. Yes? Anybody in that situation? Lots of people in that situation. Right? So we don't have to talk about that. We know where that's going. 
So there are some life preservers, right? We do have some resources to help us as we're, as we're floundering around. Um, One-off workshops, as we saw, very common. They can be in-house in your department. Usually they're external. Um, a lot of times you can get them from publishers or you know, STP. Sometimes you know, other resources do these um, kinds of things. Conferences with a teaching component. You can always get a little bit of teaching if you're going to a conference. Um, pure observation, and not observation for you know evaluation for tenure, but going just appreciative inquiry to sit in another person's class and see how they do things. I'd really love to see how you did this activity, or I'd really love to see how you do this, right? If you have a department that's open to that, you can really learn a lot by watching your colleagues and by offering them the chance to come and watch you. And then, of course, there's peer mentoring if you can get it. All right, so these are sort of the things that we have available to us. Does anybody have one or more of these things available to you in your department? I see some hands going up. Great, so about half. Great, we should all have these things available to us. All right, we should all. How else are we gonna learn? How, what else are we gonna do, right? Um, so what's missing? Well, teaching training is, is missing in the deep integration in graduate programs. It's, it can vary de widely depending on what program you're in, or even who just happens to be doing that job at the time when you're there. Because if someone gets a promotion, or they move, or they change, then there's nobody um, doing the, the work of teaching. So a formerly great program can go to be doing nothing in a very short time. Um, one program can be very different from another. What's missing are multiple teaching mentors, right? There's usually that teaching person in a department, and they shoulder all the work for teaching training. And then there's usually maybe like one other person, but you know, we all, we all knew who was gonna do our teaching class because it was the one person in my grad program who really cared about teaching. And he, he was the one who did the teaching class. Um, and then when he stopped doing that teaching class, I think they stopped. I think they stopped offering it. So um, a combination of the how-tos, the nuts and bolts, and the big picture, right? Because a new teacher needs both. You need support in just how do I do this thing today, this very basic skill, and understanding the big picture. But you have to take both in moderation, right? Just like in te learning to swim. You can't just jump into all the big skills right away. It has to be sustained support over time. A one-off is not gonna do it. Um, it's not even good enough to just have training support in grad school and then nothing else for the rest of your career. And we really need supervisors trained in supporting teaching. It was a very, very lonely role for me, being a person who supported teaching. So I, I didn't have anyone to talk about teaching mentorship with because nobody else was doing it. Um, and so you, know, you really have to look far and wide to find other people who are doing this work um, because the world needs more teaching mentors. And the biggest thing that's missing is community. Teaching is an incredibly isolating thing at times, right? Have you ever felt really alone? It, it happens in this big social context in front of all these people, but it can be so isolating if you're having a problem or you don't know what to do or you just feel like it's all on your shoulders, right? It can be a very isolating thing. Um, and especially if you feel like you're having trouble, you may not feel like you have anyone to go to to talk to uh, about what's going on in your class. So what's missing around teaching in most contexts is community. So I want to share with you some graduate teaching competencies that were developed by some colleagues of mine. And these are sort of a wish list. What would teaching be like if everyone who graduated with a doctorate also had these basic teaching competencies, just basic competencies, right? They, they, I think we can guarantee they've got this one. Disciplinary, disciplinary knowledge and expertise, right? I think that's okay, check. We can, be, we can be pretty confident if you get a PhD, you've got that. A professional identity as a teacher, right? You think of yourself as a teacher, what kind of teacher you are. You recognize that teaching happens in various contexts, right? You don't have to have experience in all of them, but you know there could be a smaller liberal arts teaching context and a research teaching context, or you know there could be a professional teaching context. You know that teaching happens in different kinds of contexts. You know how to follow educational standards and policies. You understand the principles of learning. Steve Chu would say, yes, you understand. It, it would be great if everyone knew basic principles of learning and appropriate techniques other than lecture. If you can set and communicate learning goals and expectations, if you even know what a learning objective is, how to backwards design to a learning objective, that would be great. You know how to teach for inclusion. You understand what that means. What does inclusion mean? 
you understand how to assess student learning, and not just with a multiple choice exam. You understand what evidence-based pedagogical processes are, and you know how to use them. And you also know how to assess and improve your own teaching. You recognize that that's a natural part of teaching, that the work of growing in your teaching is never done. And it's not just your, your student evaluations at the end of the semester, right? that you know all the ways. That you, now, if we started here, wow, wouldn't things be different in higher education if we just started with basic understanding of these competencies in all disciplines, not just psychology? Right? We would have very different conversations. This is in a new book by Gilmore and Hatcher, um, and there's a chapter on, uh, it's an interdisciplinary book actually, it's not psychology specific, but I think it's a nice wish list for all of us. I also think it's really important to think about graduate students in terms of their readiness for teaching. Right? And think about it, graduate students are usually just one step away from under, being an undergraduate student themselves, right? And they're still very much a student. They're on the receiving end of a lot of teaching. At the same time, they're delivering teaching. So there's a great uh, paper by Nyquist and Sprague that talks about sort of this, the phases of development of graduate student teachers. And they start off often, and this, this might, you might remember this from your early teaching days, uh, with what Nyquist and Sprague call a senior learner. Right, where your focus is on yourself and your own survival in this new, in this new task. Um, will they like me? Will they listen to me? Am I doing a good job? Am I doing this right every day? You just don't know. Um, it, Pre-socialized to teaching, right? Things are very simple in their explanation. You're very dependent on authority in the classroom, right? You feel like you need to assert yourself as an authority, and students are either friends, victim, or enemy. It's a very simplistic view of those relationships. With a little more experience, maybe after some, you know, some preliminary teaching experiences, then you, you, know, you can start to see these colleague and training characteristics emerge, um, where there's a focus on building and expanding skills. We're like, okay, well, I've done it, I lived, I made it. So now what do I do? Where you're starting to test out a few new skills. You're starting to test out a few. How do I lead a discussion? How do you lead a discussion? What do, how can I do this? Um, now they're socialized. They understand the basic context. Um, and we're interdependent with authority, right? So it's less risky to, to put yourself in a vulnerable position. Um, and then junior colleague, where the focus is on student learning. And it's a very big change to go from planning your class what, are, what am I going to do today in my class? What am I going to do today? To what are my students going to do today? And when you see that change, you realize that something else has shifted, right? Where the focus is no longer on me and my worrying about me and, and my appearance or my, you know, how I'm appearing to students or, uh, but it's really on the students. Are they getting it? What are they going to do in class today? And at this point, I think oftentimes with a little more experience, you're a little more receptive to, to trying new things, to modifying your pedagogy. Um, you're less reliant on jargon. You feel like you have the confidence to try things a little differently. And you're more collegial with authority, right? More collaborative with students. So if you think that there's almost a progression that we go through as we're learning how to teach in ourselves and our conceptualization of ourselves, it's not just about the student as well. And you need help with that. You need support with that, right? So we're actually doing our colleagues a disservice if we're not helping them as they make their way through this path. So what we really need is a paradigm shift. I think it's pretty clear what we're doing really could be a lot better. Um, if the current paradigm worked, instructors, when they start teaching, and really at any point in their career, would feel well-prepared, well-supported, confident. Students would consistently demonstrate achievement of their learning objectives. We would have great conversations. And there's not one model that's going to work in all contexts. I think it's really important to say, like, I'm not saying we have to train this way, but we have to be, I think, we have to be a little more attendant to the fact that there are themes and characteristics common to successful training. And you may not be able to do everything, but there are certain things and certain elements that are common and necessary for good teacher training and support. And so this was the focus of the chapter that my colleagues and I wrote in APA, which is not an IPI book, which is not only about intro psych, I think, but it certainly is necessary because intro psych is a particularly challenging class to teach. And that's the one that we usually give our novice teachers, right? The hardest class, let's start them out there, uh, right? So, so this is a way that we can, I'd like you to think about how we can change the paradigm and even what you can do listening to this talk. What might you do with your colleagues or your students to help change this paradigm in your own universities and institutions? 
So oh, that's a little off, but it's educational development. So our it's grounded, we're grounded in this educational development perspective, which is a focus on professional teaching for learning, right? It's really its own discipline. There are experts in educational development all across our country. Many of them are in your teaching and learning centers. Many of them come from our discipline in psychology, but you don't have to. They come from all, all different disciplines, but they're really trained and highly specialized in multidisciplinary perspectives on teaching and learning, which I think is important, and I'm going to come back to that later. But we argue, um, and especially influential in this model was Elizabeth Hammer, who is herself an expert in teaching development and, and works at a teaching center here in New Orleans. But, you know, educational development should be outcome driven, right? It should be backwards designed. So whatever we're doing to train teachers, it should be backwards designed, right? We should practice what we preach. Creates collaboration, is evidence-based, is regularly assessed and modified, is aligned with culture and mission at your institution, models evidence-based practices, and most importantly is sustained, right? That we have regular, regular doses of educational development of teaching development in the context in which we teach. teach. So let's break this down a little bit. So let's start by driven by specifics, objectives, and regularly assessed and modified. So whether or not we have like a formal course in teaching, uh, training should have clear objectives, be actively assessed, and ensure those objectives are matched. So this should be a conversation among colleagues, right, about what we want our colleagues to be doing and learning, what we want our junior colleagues to be supported in doing, what we want our students to be supported in doing. Teach evidence-based pedagogical practices and model evidence-based pedagogical practices, right? Those two go hand in hand. Leveraging cognitive science, right? We need to make, have, make sure our conversations include cognitive science, model those practices, model inclusion, right? Those are the things that we should be doing as we're training the teachers, right? So if the workshops that you're attending don't have those practices, then we need to ensure that they do. We need to offer ones that do. And we need sustained strategic opportunities that's more likely to produce long-lasting change, right? Development is not an event. It's a process. It happens over a period of time. It happens during a conversation. Is anybody familiar with the concept of community of practice? Let me see if anyone has a couple hands. Oh, if you haven't, I'm so happy to introduce you to this idea of a community of practice, right? We're in a community of practice today. A community of practice is a collection of individuals who care about some common issue, some common concern, and they're working together on that common concern, right? And the work that they do is done collaboratively, and the problems that they solve are solved dynamically together. So rather than have silos where everybody's working on their own class at one time and they're all doing one thing separate from one another, and every now and then they might talk, but they're really doing work independently, a community of practice engages more active collaboration and discussion and sharing. Right? STP is this community of practice. So again, $25, a good investment if you haven't joined. I'm going to come back to that, but first, culturally aware and aligned. Right? What is your context? The kind of training and support that you need in your context is gonna vary, right? Depending on whether you're at an HBCU or whether you're at uh, a small private liberal arts college or whether you're at a Spanish-speaking organization, right? It's always going to depend on the kind of training that your students need, right, to be successful. That's how you should support your instructors. All teaching is context dependent. And I think this is another reason why it's so hard to come to a conference and you hear, oh, I did this great thing and it was wonderful and it works in one context. There's no guarantee it's gonna work in your context. This is different students, different instructors, different everything, all right? So there's no, we always have to think about the context. And all support for training needs to be situated in that context, right? So you're having the conversation about what we're doing together, right? And we really need to talk about assessment and multiple forms of assessment and talk about that evidence. It would be great if every department actually had a conversation, a productive conversation about assessment. Wouldn't that be great? We could actually talk about the data and think about what we want our students to achieve and then have a collaborative conversation. That's a community of practice model where you're actually having a conversation about these things and thinking, okay, well, what can we all do? How are you gonna do this? Right? Does that happen? Is that happening? Maybe, well, some places, not everywhere. 
some places it's happening. I'd like to be in those places. I think that's great. It could happen everywhere. But I'm also going to say, knowing psychology is not enough. We spend a lot of time talking and thinking about content in psychology and cognitive science and learning. But you know what? Our students are also in a broader context. They are, and many, many students that we teach in psychology, the vast majority of them are taking psychology as a general education course, right? Not just our majors, right? We have a small number of majors compared to the number of students that take psychology as a general education course. And so it's really important for us to understand what else are they being exposed to? Where, do, where does psychology fit for them, right? Again, if we just stay in our little silo and we don't really think about where psychology fits in the broader picture, in the broader content, we're missing an opportunity. We actually have an awful lot to learn from our colleagues outside our home discipline. Right. But we often stay insulated. We stay, we, we really, I think, value um, psychology practices uh, disproportionately more than we should. We should really have a bit more appreciation uh, and curiosity about what's happening in other social sciences, for example, what's happening in the natural sciences, what's happening in the humanities, right? Because if we want to help situate students and understand our discipline better, it behooves us to have a better understanding of what they're being exposed to in the rest of the academic environment. And we all, do you remember how psychology is a hub science? I think this speaks to that point. Psychology is a hub science, right? We contribute to a lot of those other disciplines. We contribute, we are essential, right? The work that's happening there is informing public health, biomedical engineering, you know, all of those, you know, gerontology, psychology, ophthalmology, even, we're, we're a hub science. Um, this was big news a few years ago, right? Um, so what do we know about those other sciences? What do we know about all those other disciplines in our institution? Right? The future of gen ed is going to be more integrated. The future of psychology in the gen ed is going to be more integrated, right? Because that's what we're asking students to do is think about how do we build psychology in to the work that you're doing, right? How do we take psychology and how do we help you leverage that in whatever it is you want to do, whether that's engineering or whether that's natural sciences, right? So the future of psychology is not just psychology. The future of psychology is thinking how do we integrate what we're doing with other disciplines and how do we support students to do that? That's where we're going, folks. And if we're not even really thinking about how we're teaching in our own discipline, we're going to be in a lot of trouble <laughs> if we don't think about this soon. So I want to just take a moment to tell you about what I'm doing now. Um, I've changed from intro psych, and I'm now directing these two courses at Ohio State called the General Education Bookends. So these courses frame students' experience in the gen ed. So it's almost as if I got my dream. I always wish that every single student at Ohio State would take intro psych. I always wished that every single student could get this. Um, well, it sort of changed, but now I'm teaching a class that every single student at Ohio State takes. It does have a component of psychology, but it has a little bit more. Uh, so what we do in our launch seminar is we help students understand the purpose and the structure of our GE. We help them develop academic skills and habits that are gonna help them in their coming year. And we also, help them make a plan to develop their academic identity, to think about what they want to do and all the classes that they want to take, all the co-curricular experiences they want to take and the big problems that they care about. And at the end of their time at Ohio State, they're going to be taking a reflection seminar. And this reflection seminar, these are both one credit courses. The reflection seminar focuses on metacognitive reflection, asks them to reflect on their own intercultural competence, how they evolved and changed, and their ongoing growth, development, and well-being. Right? So it's sort of amazing that our students have this opportunity and this gift. So we've been teaching this, and Ohio State's a fairly big school, so it's a big, uh, it's a big premise. So in the past year, we just finished our first year. We've taught 9,500 students in the launch seminar. That was our very first year offering the class in 500 sections, uh, 19 students per section, and I've worked with, I've hired over 140 instructors on all campuses statewide, all five campuses statewide. Now, 
think about it. How do you launch a program like this? How do you get people to be teaching consistently in a curriculum with fidelity to the most diverse student base that you could possibly imagine, right? The full diversity of this entire institution coming through this course. Well, it relies on professional development because the instructors that we've hired are largely people coming from different places in the university. So I have teachers from psychology, from sociology, from chemistry, from dentistry, from nursing, from pharmacy, from engineering, right? All of them are taking this class together. And you want to know, there's a lot of growth that's happening in, in our conversations about teaching at our institution. And nobody has the whole picture, but everyone brings a piece of the picture. And I'd say this is true of psychology departments as well, right? Because we're not teaching generalists anymore, we're teaching specialists. So you've got your people who are specialized in clinical, specialized in developmental, specialized in cognitive and social. No one can know all of it, but we all benefit from listening to one another, right? We need to have more of those conversations, and we definitely need to have them here, right? Because we all need to understand how people are interpreting and teaching um, this class. So we developed a network of teams. So we have a set of team leads, and we have these team leads that each have a team of six to eight instructors and they meet weekly, professional development is actually built into the compensation for these positions. So it's an expectation that they will spend one hour a week in professional development. And oftentimes that's a meeting with their team where they're having a focused conversation about the curriculum, about what they're doing that week, challenges that they're encountering, new ideas, what worked, what didn't work, right? And then I meet with the team leads once a week and we talk about this at the program level and what we need to do to support it. We also actually use Microsoft Teams. It's a very dynamic community where there's a lot of resource sharing and people are constantly sharing the things that they're doing and using. And it's been amazing to see how we've tapped into people um, being willing to share, people saying for the first time they really think they're, they really believe that they're part of a teaching community when they never have felt that way before. And so again, we're tapping into that community of practice model and the characteristics of a community of practice. You have a shared domain of interest, collaborative action, and you're developing together the resources and the knowledge that you're using in your practice. We did this at Ohio State, right? We developed assessments and exams and course materials together and then shared them with the team, right? It was, it's a very dynamic, very interdependent process and it's working. It's working not only for the teachers, but for the students, right? Because they get the best experience when the teachers can talk amongst themselves and share those resources, right? And instructor success is student success. So we can't talk about instructor success, we can't talk about student success unless we're simultaneously thinking, and what are we doing for the instructor? How are we supporting the instructor? And what's the cost if we fail, right? What's the cost if we fail, if we don't support teachers, if we don't support our teaching mission, right? Well, there's actual harm to students. There's harm to students if, they're fa if we don't help them. We don't maximize a course to support their learning. Who really is hurt? Minoritized students, students who are really at risk in many ways, students who come from um, financially insecure uh, situations, they're racking up debt for classes that they don't pass, they're having bad experiences, right? That's harm. We don't want to cause harm to our students. We're causing harm to instructors by giving them bad experiences, by creating bad teaching experiences that are going to make them unhappy teaching, right? They're going to make them want to avoid teaching development and practice. And we're causing harm to the discipline of psychology, which I love very much. And we want psychology to be represented uh, in a way to students that is as dynamic and as important as it is, as we know that it is. Right? And so by investing in teaching, we're really investing in our discipline as well. But most of all, I think going back to Harry Kirk Wolf and what was written about him in science, we need to cultivate compassion. At times, we can be so compassionless in higher education, right? Um, and so I want to take a moment. If you aren't familiar with Kate Denial, she's actually a history professor, and she's written a book that's coming out soon called A Pedagogy of Kindness. She also has a, um, a blog in a community called Care in the Academy, which I highly recommend if you're interested in checking this out. Uh, a Pedagogy of Kindness asks us to apply compassion in every situation we can, not to default to suspicion or anger. When suspicion or anger is our first response, a pedagogy of kindness asks us to step back and do the reflective work of asking why. Why are we reacting in that manner? 
and other instances of disappointment uh, or mistrust? What other instances are coming to bear on this particular moment in a particular interaction? This can transform the student-teacher relationship, but it's not only on an individual-to-individual -individual level. To extend kindness means recognizing that our students possess innate humanity, which directly undermines the transactional education model which too many of our institutions lean, if not cleave to. Now this doesn't mean that we need to be, uh, you know, we, we need to just pass everyone. This doesn't mean that we need to just let students off the hook, right? This just means that we need to have some compassion, right? We need to think about students. What if we didn't call them students? What if we just called them people? <laughs> Would that change things for you if you stopped talking about them as the students in my class and started thinking about them as the people in my class? Right? And to one another as well, to think about one another as colleagues, right? Not just automatons, right? To think about the people that you work with in this humane, kind way, this pedagogy of kindness. I think we really need that in the academy. And of course, finding your own voice, finding that special sauce, finding that things that makes you unique, right? Because everyone comes with different teaching experiences, different training experiences, different lived experiences, different passions. What are the things that you really care about? How will you find your voice? I think that needs to be part of our training support as well. Encouraging people not just to do this thing that we want everyone to do, but find the thing that really resonates for you, that really fits with you and your values and your skills as an instructor. What sets you apart? So everyone, I'd like you to take some time today or soon, just think about what sets you apart from other people, from other instructors. What's your special sauce? What makes you unique in who you are? Um, Garth would have talked, Garth was yesterday, yes. Oh, it's tomorrow? Well, Garth's gonna do, if you haven't, Garth is gonna do a really wonderful workshop that's gonna help you think about that. And go, what is it that sets you apart? What's your teaching mission and your values? So our future focus, here's what I would ask for all of you to consider and think about uh, in our future focus uh, in institutions, in your own institutions, in your own departments, in your teaching context. Is it too much to ask for institutional level teaching competencies? Is it too much to ask that we all, for our, certainly for our graduate students, but what about for all of our instructors. I just saw something that uh, Regan Garung posted where now if you're teaching a gen ed class in, um, at Oregon State, all gen ed instructors are gonna be asked to participate in teaching development, require teaching development if you're teaching a gen ed class. Right? I think that's a step in that direction. Now it has to be good teaching development, right? It has to meet those standards that we talked about. It has to be high quality, it has to be regularly assessed, it has to be inclusive, uh, evidence-based. But what would it be like if we actually had that? Where we, where it wasn't a punishment, right? It was something that we looked forward to. It was conversations that we wanted to go to, right? That we, we enjoyed, that was part of our, it's something that we celebrated about our, our teaching experience and our role. And consistent socially supported training practices that are objective driven, assessed and modified, evidence based, sustained and collaborative, culturally responsive to students, instructors, and contexts, compassionate and kind and authentic. I think that's the dream. I think that's my dream <laughs> for teaching students in higher education. Um, and I hope all of you can just think about what resonates with you. Is there one thing that perhaps you might be able to take back to your department, your institution, the context in which you work, and think, how about we just do this one thing, right? And just see where it gets us. So we can all do one thing. So that's what I have to say, and I just want to thank you for coming today. Thank you all for being teachers of psychology. Thank you all for being here at this conference and for your time today. Thank you.